Our next speaker is uh, Sheila Violet, uh, who is going to talk about biomarkers uh, that monitor the activity of STX 100. So are we on, okay. So my talk is really going to be focused on describing how and why we developed a biomarker strategy to support the clinical development of SDX100, which is a humanized antibody directed against the alpha V-beta-6 integrin, with lead <coughs> clinical indication being for patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So as many folks in the room know, there's been a number of challenges that are associated with drug development today. Um, we're increasingly moving forward into therapeutic areas with very novel biologies and going after targets that have simply not been validated in the clinic. And IPF would certainly fall into this category. So we're really taking on a lot more technical uh, risk in the development process these days. We're also increasingly focusing on chronic slow progressive diseases such as IPF, where the clinical trials are becoming of longer and longer duration. And so we're taking a lot on a lot more clinical development risk as well. And in many cases, these risks, both the technical risks as well as the clinical development risks, are not really being fully discharged until we run our phase three trials and spending upwards of hundreds of millions of dollars. And so a major question today in drug development really relates to how can we integrate a translational medicine approach into the various earliest stages of drug development to minimize the risk earlier in the process and to spend fewer dollars to get some informative answers also very early in the process. And in many cases, it's not a tools problem. It's not that we don't know what questions to ask and we don't know how to address these questions, but it's a cultural problem. It's how we think about drug development and whether or not we're really invested and dedicated to putting in the dollars to integrate a translational medicine approach in these very early stages of drug development. So this slide highlights in the top arrows the estimated costs that are associated with the three major stages of drug development. These are estimated costs and they really depend upon the particular clinical indication that you're talking about and the trial design. They also don't take into the costs that are associated with the really early stages of drug development during your research and your preclinical phase, which can also be quite expensive. But the point here is that when you go into your phase three studies, you're often investing hundreds of millions of dollars. And this is really a problem if this, if this is the place where you're really discharging the majority of the risk. And this has really been a problem, quite honestly, for the industry to deal with when they're thinking about fibrotic disease, particularly diseases like IPF. So there are a couple of ways of thinking about the problem. It's not been unusual for industry to first be very, very focused on what they want their target product profile to look like, and then build their pivotal trial design and the full clinical development plan very focused on that target product profile. And it's not completely unreasonable to be taking this into account, especially if you're thinking about a disease which has a crowded market. But there really is a growing understanding, and I think this is sort of building out in uh, when we're thinking about fibrosis clinical trials, that we really need to be thinking about integrating a translational medicine approach in the very, very early stages of drug development that allow us to really home in on what the basic biological hypothesis is for that target and test that really early in the clinical trials and use the data from those clinical trials to gate as to whether or not it makes sense to invest the money where you then go into your phase 2B and your phase 3 studies and test your clinical hypothesis. And I think the other thing we need to take into account is whether it makes sense to be putting the patients into these trials if you don't have really good data in your very early clinical trials to validate that target. So a case in point where we were sort of forced to take this approach, and I think it ended up uh, was a very eye-opening experience for the folks that were involved in this process and sort of has changed our thinking about how we think about designing clinical trials was for the STX100 program. So as I mentioned, STX100 is a humanized antibody directed against the alpha V beta 6 integrin. And the basic therapeutic hypothesis for this target is that alpha V beta 6 is expressed at very low levels in healthy normal tissue highly upregulated on injured epithelium, and when it's upregulated, it's been found to be a pretty important mediator of TGF-beta activation. So if you boil this down to, well, what's the core biological hypothesis for this program, it's simply that if we dose patients with STX100, we should expect that we can get the drug to the dose levels that are necessary and to the right places 
to effectively inhibit alpha V beta 6 mediated TGF beta activation in the target organ. And since our lead clinical indication is IPF, for us the target organ is lung. And then the clinical hypothesis would then be an extension of this, that if you can effectively inhibit alpha V beta 6 mediated TGF beta activity, that this will translate into slowing or stopping fibrogenesis, and that that should then uh, translate into preserving lung function. Now, one of the limitations to doing a really early phase 2A trial in IPF is that it's almost virtually impossible to test that clinical hypothesis because you're simply not dosing patients for a long enough period of time and enough number of patients in order to see a statistically significant change, excuse me, change in pulmonary function. But it is a really great opportunity to test the basic biological hypothesis and then use the data from that uh, early testing of the biological hypothesis as a gate for whether or not it makes sense to go into your later clinical trials. And if you do this in a quantitative manner, to also get some information about what you think your clinically active dose is for those later clinical trials. And that's really important because unfortunately in many cases we really do go forward into our phase 2B and our phase 3 trials not really having a good handle on the clinically active dose and then getting to the end of these very expensive phase 3 trials and saying, well, maybe I wasn't dosing high enough. So that's something that we also really need to be thinking to integrate into the very early uh, stages of the clinical development. And while it seems like a really obvious thing to do, we don't do it enough. So this slide um, illustrates mechanistically how it is that alpha V beta 6 leads to the localized activation of TGF beta. The brown cells represent the injured epithelium and the blue receptors represent alpha V beta 6. TGF beta gets secreted as an inactive latent complex that's shown by these sort of acorn-like structures where the N-terminal portion of the molecule, referred to as LAP and shown as these gray regions of these acorn structures, is cleaved off of the larger protein as it's secreted from cells, but then it stays <coughs> non-covalently associated with the mature active portion of TGF-beta that's shown by these red regions. And TGF-beta is expressed as a large latent complex, a lot of it uh, on a complex of the extracellular matrix proteins, and also expressed uh, as this inactive latent complex on the surface of cells. So the bottom line is that TGF-beta has to go through an activation step in order to bind to its cognate receptors. And it was shown in Dean Shepard's lab back in 1999 and then really validated over the last 10 to 12 years that alpha V beta 6 binds with pretty high affinity in the low nanomolar range to an RGD motif within LAP induces a conformational change, and now we recognize from recent studies from Tim Springer's labs, this leads to an actual release of the active portion of TGF-beta to then be available to bind to its cognate receptors. And so we've generated a uh, antibody, a humanized antibody that binds with very high affinity, higher affinity than the native ligand. So the antibodies bind in the low picomolar range and essentially shut down alpha V beta 6 mediated TGF beta activation. And what we've really come to understand from working on this target for the last 10 years that is that there's really two major biologies that this antibody has an impact in. We know that it has very good antifibrotic effects through its effects on TGF beta and the fibroblasts, but we've also really equally important come to understand that it helps to maintain the integrity of the epithelium. And this is really important when we think about uh, choices of lead clinical indications and a disease like IPF where I think there's a growing understanding that injury to the epithelium sort of feeds the fire, fire for driving the pathogenesis or the fibrotic reaction. So we've also learned in the last 10 years that there are really three major tissues where alpha V beta 6 is highly upregulated in human disease and that blocking it translates into pretty good antifibrotic activity and protection to the epithelium. And that includes the kidney, the lung, and the liver. And for any one of these tissues, there's a pretty long list of diseases. I've just listed three for each of these tissues. But there's a pretty long list of diseases where we might think about uh, applying STX100. But what was important for us was to identify those diseases for which there was really good scientific rationale, but really equally important where we could execute a clinical trial and integrate a translational medicine approach in the very earliest stages of development. And IPF sort of percolated to the top, and I'll take you through that. So I've talked a lot about this upregulated expression of alpha V beta 6 on injured epithelium. And so we did quite a bit of work in the early days with this program to understand in what human diseases alpha V beta 6 is upregulated in the lung. And generally speaking, 
In any disease where you have an inflammatory fibrotic pathology, we see this upregulated expression. Your reference for normal is this top left-hand panel, and there is some expression, this is immunohistochemistry, uh, in normal lung, but the point is, is that it's very highly upregulated in disease. The middle panels are representative sections from patients that have a diagnosis of scleroderma with UIP, and the bottom panels are patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And what we've found, and Dean Shepard's lab has found, and others have found, is that when alpha V beta 6 is upregulated in IPF lung tissue, it's highly upregulated mostly in the distal airways on both type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes. And we see these um, uh, upregulated expression at regions where you have an ongoing fibrotic reaction and the fibrotic foci, but also what I would call in sort of these cold fibrotic lesions. And it's very reminiscent of what we're finding in the animal models that alpha V beta 6, unlike in the wound healing response where it's a transient upregulated expression, generally speaking the fibrosis models, it's upregulated and it's persistently upregulated. So something is driving its expression and it really brings us to the importance of the uh, data that was uh, presented by Amanda Tatler from Gisley Jenkins' lab that we really need to now, and they're really sort of finding out what are the mechanisms that regulate the upregulated expression of alpha V beta 6, which is TGF beta itself, and that there are repressors of the expression of this, and perhaps this is being lost in disease. So also over the last several years, we've really tested the uh, blocking antibodies in a range of different injury and fibrosis models affecting the kidney, the lung, and the liver. And I'm just showing you some of the data, uh, really a snapshot of data from two of the lung fibrosis models, the bleomycin model on the left and the radiation-induced lung fibrosis model on the right. And we looked at a variety of endpoints, but I just want to point out the important features because this data really uh, published back a number of years ago. We were really keen on doing full dose response studies. And this is really, you know, one of the things you absolutely must do in industry is to get a really good handle on what are the doses that are required to get full efficacy so then you can understand drug exposure levels and translate this into what you expect your clinically active dose to be. And collectively what we found in all of the lung injury and fibrosis models is that we have near maximal protective effects at one mg per kg dose once weekly. So this is a pretty potent antibody. And so what I'm showing you on the left is expression of collagen using the collagen 1 alpha 2 promoter mice ligated to the luciferase gene, where here is the 1 mg per kg dose. And then the radiation model was uh, run in John Munger's lab at NYU. And one of the things I like about the radiation model is that it's a very slow progressing model of fibrosis that occurs over the course of about six months. But you get um, quite a bit of fibrosis affecting larger regions of the lung than you generally see in bleo. So it allows you to do nice dose response studies. And what John found, again, was that we had near maximal activity at one mg per kg dose once weekly. Now, this is really going back to the early days of the program. There was a, quite a bit of skepticism at Biogen that a, a molecule like alpha V beta 6 that was so selective for how it activated TGF beta that it would really have good antifibrotic activity. And how would this compare to a systemic inhibitor of the TGF beta pathway? So, in all of our studies, we always compared to the soluble uh, TGF beta type 2 receptor expressed as an FC fusion protein, which has been tested in a range of fibrosis models. And we find generally speaking, and that was tested at 5 mg per uh, kg, that we have equally good activity, if not better activity, in those models where alpha V beta 6 is upregulated. So there was a lot of discussion yesterday about what can we learn from these fibrosis models and do they have any relevance to human disease. And I think it really comes down to what the question is that you're asking. So the things that we learned was that we really use these models to dissect the pathway. And that was the point that Jack Galdi was making is that they really allow you to test a pathway. And so we were able to test how our antibody compared to a soluble inhibitor of TGF beta. We did extensive transcript profiling analyses as well as signaling studies to understand the mechanism of action of our drug. We did studies where we administered the antibody during the inflammatory phase as well as delayed treatment studies. So they really help you dissect a pathway. But I think the point that Talmadge is making is, is that at the end of the day, they probably have very minimal relevance to the pathogenesis of IPF. And I think that most of us would absolutely agree with that. 
and that we would be fooling ourselves if we think that testing an agent in the bleomycin model is validation that this is likely to be working in IPF. So I think both Dean and um, Talmarge are right. I don't know if they, you need to argue this out at the ATS, but it's a good exercise. But I think at the end of the day, it's, it's what, what you're using the animal models to question. So the question then is, well, how can you get that data to give you the confidence that you want to take it into a clinical trial? And it's my personal belief that we really have to make as many connections to human disease, and it would be my preference that we work with human disease samples, learn as much as we can about the pathway, and build that back into the animal models. And I think that you know that's obviously where the field is hoping to go. So this has been our rationale for supporting taking it into IPF. So first of all, we know that alpha-V beta-6 is highly upregulated in the lung tissue of IPF uh, patients. And that when it's upregulated, we have pretty decent evidence now that it does appear to be an important mediator of TGF beta activation, and that blocking it translates into pretty good protective effects, both on the epithelium as well as uh, with regard to fibrogenesis. But then the question is, how do we now continue to connect this to human disease? And I think IPF is one of those fibrotic diseases for which there's been pretty decent rationale building over the years that activation of the TGF beta pathway seems to be a dominant driver of the fibrogenic reaction. So for instance, we know that there's a very robust TGF beta transcriptional signature in lung tissue from IPF patients, and this is correlated with markers of fibrosis. We also know that the active form of TGF beta is expressed in the alveolar epithelium at focal areas of fibrosis, and that alpha V beta 6 expression almost mirrors this precisely. And I think, you know, with this crowd it could be debated, but I do think that there is some decent evidence that fibrosis, as it's occurring in IPF patients, is negatively correlated with pulmonary function and survival. But the big question for the field is, if you have a very good antifibrotic and an inhibitor to, uh, of epithelial injury, what's the evidence that we think that this is really going to translate into a clinical benefit in these patients? And I think at the end of the day, the only way we're going to be able to do this is to test this in the clinic. So, we had a very good rationale for testing uh, the alpha V beta 6 antibody in the clinic, but there was a real need to develop a biomarker strategy to give people the appetite to want to then take data from a phase 2A trial and take it into the, the expensive phase 2B and phase 3 studies. So we were really forced to develop a biomarker strategy. And one of the limitations that we had is that, as I mentioned, alpha V beta 6 has restricted expression to injured epithelium. And we felt it was really important for us to actually try to identify or, or survey what was happening at the interface where alpha V beta 6 is upregulated in the epithelium, and we wouldn't be able to really do this very easily by pulling peripheral bloods. And so we have the added complexity there that it's pretty challenging to obtain lung tissue biopsies from patients for a clinical trial. So while it's difficult to obtain the lung biopsies, what we did learn from talking to a number of investigators in this room was that we could fairly readily obtain bronchoalveolar lavage, and by that I mean both the fluid as well as the cells that reside in the distal airways, and that this wouldn't be something we would want to do for a larger trial, like a phase 2B or a 3 trial, but it could be done to support a phase 2A study. So this became a really important strategy to us, again, for a number of scientific and technical reasons. First of all, when you isolate bowel from patients, you isolate millions of cells. So it really gives you a lot of material to work with to look at transcriptional changes as well as protein phosphorylation changes. And this is something that we really need to be thinking about when we think about biomarker strategies because sometimes we want to gain access to tissues or a few cells here and there that just don't give you a la large enough amount of material to work with. The other thing is, is that when you isolate the bowel cells, you're largely isolating cells that reside in the distal airways. This is precisely where alpha V beta 6 is upregulated, and this is where the disease is ongoing in these patients. And then lastly, we had some really important data from Dean Shepard's lab, which really, I think, provided a, provides a really great example of how a collaboration between academia and industry can really work to help with these translational medicine approaches, and uh, we should be thinking about doing more of this. And what Dean had found was that the bowel macrophage 
from beta-6 knockout mice were great biosensors of alpha V beta-6 mediated TGF beta signaling. So if he isolated the bowel macrophage from the beta-6 knockout mice or just administered a couple doses of our antibody, he saw major reductions in TGF beta signaling that could be monitored by PSMAD2 or looking at uh, TGF beta regulated genes. So the goal of our phase 2A trial is that in addition to looking at the standard things that the FDA wants you to look at, such as PK, safety and tolerability of your drug, as well as in our case immunogenicity because this is a biologic, we're integrating this biomarker strategy to demonstrate that we can get to the right doses uh, that are safe and effectively inhibit a target pathway in the target organ that we think is important to the pathogenesis of fibrosis in these patients. So, uh, in our clinical trial, we'll be collecting BAL from patients at baseline and then after eight weekly doses of drug treatment uh, by bronchoscopy. And this right-hand side is a magnification of the distal regions of the lung. And again, the reason why this works for us from a scientific point of view is that alpha V beta 6, when it's expressed in the lung, is expressed on the interstitial side of the epithelium. So the blue region represents the ep epithelial cells and the underlying interstitium. So when alpha V beta 6 is expressed in the lung, it's expressed on the interstitial side, provides a mechanism for activating TGF beta and presenting it to the fibroblasts that can actually penetrate the basement membrane and make intimal contact with the epithelial cells. But it's also expressed on the luminal side. And so again, it provides a mechanism for activating TGF beta and presenting it to the cells in the bowel compartment. So in the clinical trial, we'll be collecting bowel, and it's going to get split into multiple aliquots, with one aliquot going off for isolating RNA to evaluate gene expression by AFI analysis, as well as qPCR of a pre-specified list of genes. And also, another aliquot will go off for preparing protein lysate to look at PSMAD2 levels. And so uh, there are a couple of very classic ways to look at TGF beta signaling that I'm sure you're all aware of. Uh, this is showing you uh, the epithelium where alpha V beta 6 is expressed, uh, provides a mechanism for activating TGF beta and presenting it to its receptors. And one of the very classic ways to monitor TGF beta signaling is to look at the, the most immediate protein phosphorylation events. And those that have probably been the best characterized is phosphorylation of the SMAD proteins. So we'll be monitoring PSMAD2 normalized to total SMAD2 levels. And then the other is to look at TGF beta regulated genes, and that would capture genes that are both from the canonical signaling pathway as well as through the non canonical signaling pathway. And so again, the idea is that alpha V beta 6 will bind to the uh, integrin and essentially shut down alpha V beta 6 mediated TGF beta signaling uh, in the bowel cells or show at least some major reductions. So one of the other things that we wanted to do before we actually um, began our clinical trial was to gain access to large collections of human bowel cells uh, to do a couple of things to validate this approach. And this was really critical to us, and this was carried out through a really important collaboration with Anjay Prasi at the University of Freiburg, and also gaining access to some important data sets through a collaboration with uh, Ivan Rosas and Naftali Kaminsky. And the reason why we want to do this is we really wanted, before we got our hands on the clinical samples, to develop all of the protocols and assays in order to isolate good quality protein lysate, RNA, good yields, and have all of the assays validated prior to, again, working with the clinical trials. And while it sounds like an obvious thing to do and a pretty mundane thing to do, the thing is, is that you absolutely have to have this all in place before you start doing with the clinical samples because you don't want to be working out these details with those very valuable samples. The other thing is, is that it allowed us to validate the expression of any one of the genes of interest to make sure that they were in the, the linear range of our assays as well as the expression of PSMAD2. And very importantly, it gave us a look at inter and intrapatient variability. And this is critically important because we wanted to have some sense of for our power calculations that we were enrolling the right number of patients in our high dose groups to see a statistically significant change. And I'll come back to uh, why that's uh, so important. So, and then one of the other things was that we wanted to extend the studies that were carried out in mice into primates. So we carried out a pretty large study in primates. It involved 30 animals where we dosed them with uh, uh, either placebo or five increasing concentrations now of our clinical candidate, the STX100 antibody. And we collected uh, BAL as well as serum and PBMCs at baseline and then after eight weekly doses of drug treatment. 
And then we uh, out, uh, uh, isolated uh, the protein lysate in the RNA from the bowel cells and evaluated PSMAD2 levels as well as looked at gene expression changes. And this also now, for the first time, took us a little bit forward, a little bit closer to the patients, and really identifying those lists of genes that are differentially regulated in primates by the clinical candidate as opposed to uh, the murine parent antibody. So this is showing you the PSMAD2 data normalized to total SMAD, and this is exactly what we would love to see in a clinical trial. So what you can see was that we saw a statistically significant decrease in PSMAD2 at the 0.3 mg per kg dose and plateauing when we got to steady state levels at the 1 mg per kg dose. And where the data became particularly powerful to us was when we analyzed on an individual animal basis everything uh, relative to their actual drug exposure levels. And what I can tell you is that this data, looking at PSMAD2, went very closely hand in hand with the gene changes that are markers of TGF-beta activation. One of the questions we get asked a lot is, well, how does the data that you're generating in the bowel cells compare, do you think, to what's going on in the tissue? We actually have a pretty good data set in the mouse. So the top panel is looking at PSMAD2 after two doses of increasing concentrations of the murine antibody. And this was data that was generated originally in Dean Shepard's lab. And what he found was that at one make per kg, there was about a 70% reduction in PSMAD2 and about a 90% reduction at three makes per kg. And if you correlate this with what we know is happening with tissue fibrosis in the, uh, or fibrosis in the actual tissue, in the BLEO model, here's a dose response looking at collagen expression, where at the one make per kg, we get about a 75% reduction. And in the radiation model, we'll have almost full uh, inhibition at one make per kg. So it suggests a couple of things, that you don't necessarily have to get complete inhibition of uh, fibrosis or uh, PSMAD2 signaling uh, in order to see uh, um, pretty good inhibition here. Now, one of the other things, as I mentioned, is that in the clinical trial, we'll be evaluating gene expression uh, for all genes by AFI analysis. But we also felt that it was really important to prospectively identify about a half dozen genes that we're going to evaluate uh, by qPCR. So it's basically putting the stake in the ground and saying, I have confidence that I will be seeing not only a change in PSMAD2, but a change in these TGF-beta regulated genes. So the question was, how did we get to this list of genes? So this is a kind of a complex slide. It involved a lot of filtering steps. But basically what we did was we started with our primate data. And we took all of the RNA from the primate study and ran it on AFI chips and just asked a very broad question, what are the, T the STX100 regulated genes? And we identified 487 genes that were regulated or affected by STX100 treatment. And this is where we now integrated the human data set because we wanted to do power calculations. So we, as the next filter, we took the full change effect that we observed for each and every one of these 487 genes at the one mg per kg dose in the primate study and then evaluated the interpatient variability that we had across the patient samples, the bowel cells that we got from Aunt Jay Prossi. And then in our clinical trial, we had the high doses have six active and a total of eight placebo. So we carried out power calculations to determine, given that expected full change effect and that expected degree of interpatient variability or coefficients of variation, how many of those 487 genes in this exercise would be powered. And we determined that more than half of them were powered. So the next filters we put on this was we went into the literature and asked, what are really obvious TGF-beta regulated genes that people have demonstrated? And then we had the uh, data set from Dean Shepard of the genes that were differentially regulated in the beta-6 null mice to, uh, as compared to wild-type mice as a completely objective look at this. And we ended up boiling it down to actually a pretty nice list of genes, but we narrowed it to six where we put, picked genes from different sort of biological buckets. So something that's a marker of matrix deposition, something that's a marker of leukotriene activation, something that's a marker of um, uh, matrix cross-linking. 
And this is um, the design of our clinical trial, which is currently ongoing. So there are basically four dose cohorts uh, that range from a very low dose of 0.015 mg per kg to satisfy the FDA and going up to uh, the one mg per kg dose. There are six active and two placebo per treatment group. So there are a total of 32 patients with eight of these being placebo. And we're currently here in the middle of our first dose cohort and expect to complete the trial over the next 16 months. So in summary, I think we have a pretty strong rationale for targeting the alpha V beta 6 integrin in fibrotic disease and particularly high in IPF. We've generated a therapeutic antibody, an efficacy package, and a tox package that has supported taking this program forward into IPF patients with the FDA. We've developed a biomarker strategy, as I've described, to allow us to see in our phase 2A trial if, in addition uh, to looking at safety and tolerability, that we're getting to the appropriate doses and effectively inhibiting this target pathway that we think is important to fibrogenesis in IPF patients. And as I mentioned, our phase 2A trial in patients is in progress. Uh, there have been a number of folks that have really contributed to this program. You know, this program has been in development for a long time over the years. And um, I certainly hope it's sort of like the uh, tortoise and the hare story that, that we've been somewhat methodical with this. But sometimes you can be too clever, so we, we'll just see how this all works out. But there have been a number of folks that have really contributed to this program over the years, uh, a number of people at Biogen IDEC, and a number of people that have not, not only collaborated on the science, but have really provided advice to us along the way with our clinical trial. And I'd like to thank all of those folks, particularly Dean Shepard, who has really um, stayed with this program and helped us really think uh, quite a bit along the way about how we might think not only about about validating this as a target, but how we could develop a biomarker strategy and really take this into the clinic. Thank you. That was very nice, fantastic work. Thank you. Hal. Okay, yeah, so I agree there's a leap of faith we have to take in early phase to kind of late phase trials because the clinical endpoints just take a lot of patience right. and time. Um, and the big risk there, are, are, our cost is financial. Uh, the numbers you put up though for a phase three trial, I mean, I believe them, but you know, phase three trials in other settings have been done more cheaply. And the one I'm thinking of is the IPF network. Um, now I'm sure there are differences and I don't understand all the differences, but. Can you just comment on that cost? Because the cost for the IPF net studies was, you know, maybe one tenth of that, and arguably, maybe yeah, that didn't, you know, cover well, everything you need to cover. But so, that could yeah. be an important issue. So I don't know how easy it is to go back to that slide to look at the cost. So those are really wide brackets because that slide is a generic slide for chronic chronic diseases. It's not specific to IPF. So that captures anything from lupus, asthma could be diabetic kidney disease. Those are very, so that slide is not specific to IPF at all. So, so that's really affecting that. So um, I don't know what the low end cost I had put on the phase three, and if we can pull that up. Um, I want to say it was like seven, uh, 75 to 300. Yeah, I think it was 75. So, so let's say low end 75. I don't know how much the INET was to run two phase three trials. You're also talking a new chemical entity, which is quite different than drugs that have been around for quite a while with yeah. no preclinical work, pharmacokinetic, biomarker, dose ranging, um, et cetera. But these are just, yeah, but uh, what those costs are just, but that, I think the discrepancy here is that that covers just all diseases. I'm sort of talking generically about the costs that are often associated with these chronic slow progressing diseases. But uh, I, uh, what would be... Yeah, no, and I think that, you know, that that's often what happens when things are being run in um, uh, uh, industry is that you have these fully loaded programs where you want to have a lot of controls and you want, uh, and I mean, control over the data and, and uh, tracking and things like that. And I, you know, quite honestly, I don't know how open industry is as a whole. 
for giving up the control on those clinical trials either. Moises, yes, I, I have a biological question. Um, what your antibody is going to do is to inhibit the recept the, this alpha B beta six and avoid the um, activation of TGF beta, but the amount of latent TGF beta will not be modified. That's and right. I am wondering if, if it in it is in a long term disease like IPF, where do you have a lot of other things that are able to activate TGF beta like MMP9, oxidative stress? What do you think that is going to happen yeah. in the long term? Well, you really have to believe, and that's one of the things that we'll be sort of testing here, that when alpha V beta 6 is upregulated, it appears to be a dominant driver of fibrosis. And that while there are other mechanisms, um, that this would be one that still has a pretty big impact at the interface of where the epithelium is becoming injured. So we, you know, it's really based on a wide range of animal models now, where even though you have this very specific exp upregulated expression at the epithelium, um, and all these other mechanisms for activating TGF-beta, that we still see these pretty profound effects. The other flip side to that is that's also sort of the beauty of it. You want that balance that we don't want to be inhibiting all of the TGF-beta because of all of its normal regulatory functions. So, there's, you know, it, this is also a place where there's uh, a leap of faith from the animal models where we've seen such great antifibrotic activity, even in these long-range models like these six-month studies, that that will translate to in, in the clinic. Greg Downing. So, a very interesting talk. Uh, gives a, one a, an eye uh, insight into how long this really takes. But the question I have is one thing that we touched on a little bit earlier is that could you use this antibody as a non-invasive imaging biomarker of disease activity? I know it might be difficult with your antibody to use it as, you know, an index of your <laughs> clinical trial, but Sorry. for other clinical trials, could, could you label this with a paramag paramagnetic probe yeah. or, or a radioactive probe? I, I don't mean to be rude, my laughing Dean was standing behind you, so Dean was uh, pushing me in this the other morning, pushing very hard, and usually when Dean has an idea, it usually is pretty good. Um, absolutely. And uh, so uh, people may be aware that there have been peptides made, um, for instance, based on uh, other ligands to alpha V beta 6 that have been used as imaging agents in the context of oncology. And there's a whole oncology story for this program as well. So yes, uh, definitely there is this idea, because w one of the things that is absolutely clear to us is that one of the earliest markers in all of these models, and even when we look at human disease samples of epithelial injury, is upregulated expression of alpha V beta 6. So um, there are certain diseases, uh, other fibrotic diseases like primary scler sclerosis and cholangitis where they don't know how to identify those patients early, but we know alpha V beta 6 is highly upregulated, so perhaps those patients which have this upregulated disease are the ones who are going to have the most progressive disease. And, you know, Gisli's uh, data as well showing that the expression of alpha V beta 6, the high expressors are correlated with the poor survival. So it's something that I think now we're at that phase where we need to sort of push to see what can be done on that front. You often get this sort of support when you're starting to go into a clinical trial. And so um, that's something that I, I have to sort of really push to see if we can do something like that. Dean. So uh, I have a uh, conflict of interest. I'm Dean Shepard. You're <laughs> so, <laughs> a little biased. The, so the, uh, I wanted to address Mo Moises' question. I think, I think it's a really important issue that there are all these ways you could activate TGF-beta uh, in a test tube and in vivo. And it's actually, it was very surprising to us from the beginning, even in the mi a simple system like the mice, where there are lots of ways to activate TGF-beta, that just blocking this one, not even all the way, but partially, seemed to be sufficient to prevent the, develop, the progression or development of disease. And I think the issue is that the amount of TGF-beta that you need to activate for maintaining normal homeostasis is pretty little. But you don't want, you know, if evolution didn't, didn't uh, uh, allow us to develop disease. It wouldn't, you know, work to develop disease. So it turns out you need to activate a whole lot more TGF-beta to really get disease. 
So all we really need to do, I think, is to take off a little bit on the top in order to have an impact. So even though there are other ways TGF-beta can be activated, that's a good thing because it maintains the homeostatic you know, effects of low doses, low amounts of TGF-beta. But if you can just take it down a little bit, we might have an impact on disease. And some evidence for that is that we can also block pulmonary fibrosis by eliminating alpha-V integrins on fibroblasts, so and alpha-V beta-6 isn't even there. So they're also act that's also another way that TGF-beta is getting activated in the same tissue. And, you know, inhib so inhibiting it from a number of different angles could be sufficient to, to treat disease. And, you know, as Sheila said, the only way we'll really know is when we do the experiment in, in people. But at least there's reason to be hopeful that you don't have to get rid of all the ways that TGF-beta gets activated to be effective. So when you look at gene expression in mice, what are the genes that continue to be expressed uh, when you knock down um, when, when you block alpha, alpha V basis. So, so remember, even in the original microarrays that Naftali did in the knockout mice, we didn't see elimination of, any T, of all TGF-beta inducible gene signatures. It was just that there was a significant reduction in the magnitude of expression of those mm -hmm. genes. So it's true across the board, right, actually. Right. Okay.